See you tonight. They're put me on this pulpit mic. I just realized when I got up here, I forgot my microphone. So I'm going to get us started singing. Stephen's going to come and lead us. I'll go back and get mic'd up. But we're going to sing hymn number 561. If you're able to stand together with us, hymn number 561. I love to tell the story. And I hope that uh, all of us get a little convicted when we sing this song because I believe all of us need a little bit better do a little better job at telling that story because if you're like me, sometimes you get locked jaw and you forget to spread it like we should. We'll hear a little bit about that. Brother Green will come after a while and preach to us and tell a little bit about what we can do to get that story out. But uh, we're going to sing this song. It's a good one. I love to tell the story of unseen things above of Jesus and his glory. Thank you, sir. Let's sing together. 561. Brother Stephen, come lead us in that. I love to tell the story appreciate each of you being here tonight and I'm looking forward to a great time in the Lord's house. Amy and I and Maddie, we're glad to be back. Allie's uh, downstairs with the teens, I suppose, but we are thankful to be back home and thank you for praying for us and thank you for being here when we got back. I was afraid maybe it'd just be me and Tom Green and we'd come in here and everybody would have run off, but here you are and we're grateful that you're here. I'm going to go over a few prayer requests and then I'm going to have Brother Tim Davenport, if you don't mind, Brother Tim, to come on up and pray for us. And uh, he is, if he looks a little ragged and and weary and um, and troubled and perplexed that's because he's been at camp all summer he's a camp director up in West Virginia and uh, so those West Virginia kids they're a rough brunch and a rough group so uh, but Mount Salem Revival Grounds up uh, uh, above not too far from Clarksburg and uh, over on Route 50 across 77 and so we're thankful for him and the camping ministry that God has raised up up there they've had it for years 50 years coming up and uh, Brother Joe Boyd, an evangelist from yesteryear, started it years ago. And thank God for the camping ministry. And we're having him come pray for us. But let me give you these few announcements. He won't, or a few.
few requests. He won't remember these names, but I want you to remember them. Be praying for Miss Mary Ellison. Uh, she's uh, been she's been in Encompass Rehab, but she's going to be leaving there, I believe, next Monday. And then he's got some appointments over in Knoxville that she's got to go to. So please keep uh, Mary in your prayers, if you would. And uh, then continue to pray for Barney Bear. He uh, took treatments today. I talked to him after his treatments. And so keep him lifted up in prayer, if you would, please. And uh, ask the Lord to bless Karen Cole. She's having, really having a rough time. Talked to her on the phone yesterday. And uh, so keep her lifted up in prayer as well. Brother Bob Daniels got some counts that are lower than they need to be. So keep he and Sheila in your prayers. And uh, then Miss Sharon Harmon, they're probably watching tonight, her and Craig. But uh, keep Miss Sharon lifted up in your uh, prayers, a lot, of, a lot of pain going on, and we just uh, need, need your prayers to help uh, our sister through this, uh, th through this valley and trust in the Lord through all of that and continue to pray for Miss Edith Rourke as well. And Brother Lynn Anderson's taking treatments. And so we've got a lot of folks to pray for that uh, on your list there. We'll just go over some of those. We're praying for Brother Jim Cox. I talked to Diane the other day. He's recovering after that knee surgery. Brother John Young, he's here tonight, but just uh, praying for that arm and that wrist. So keep him lift up in prayer. Miss Diana Edwards, and then the ones there with cancer on our list, we want you to lift those up in prayer. And then health concerns here, praying for Joel Johnson and Jan Saylor and Pat Shaw, Lola and Edgar Gamble and Sherry Edens, Sheila Daniels, as we mentioned, Risa Wampler, who's here tonight, Stephanie Stedman, Susie Gregory, and Linda Willis. And then we've got some with upcoming procedures, Trista and Brother Philip Talbert and Phil Stockslager. I want to lift up all of those, if you would, please. And then, as I mentioned, Mary Ellison, also pray for James Presley. We were, some folks were able to see him this week, and uh, he's doing well over at Agape, but please keep him lift up in prayer. Please, please pray for Mildred Hill as well, as she's there at Agape. So we've got many folks to pray for, praying for Louise Watts and Palma Hodges. And then, as you know, I was, got to address the county commission board the other day, uh, Jim Wheeler and then the rest of them, and I was so happy to report to them that our church prays for them, and I challenge you to pray through this list because um, we sometimes take pot shots at, at politicians and different folks, but they don't need our complaints, they need our prayers. And uh, so we need to be praying for them. And uh, so it was a joy to get to meet them the other night. So then we're praying for some of our missionaries, those three there, the Joneses and the Marshalls and the Pritchards, and uh, praying for Maddie Brown as well. She continues deputation. She's here with us tonight. But just pray that God would give her many meetings as she continues on raising funds to get over there, the deputation trail. And uh, then we'll have Brother Tom Green. He'll uh, share some things with us tonight. You'll be blessed by that. And then praying for the ministries this week, the three and four-year-old department, praying for the uh, Pathfinders, the uh, young folks, 6th through 12th grade uh, that ride our buses. Please keep uh, the Radfords lifted up in prayer, praying for the Magnuses, praying for Danny Jenkins, our Deacon of the Week, and Miss Shirley, and uh, praying for bus number 12, Elijah Gay and Marty Scroggs and Mercy and uh, Trista and Evan, and asking the Lord to strengthen them, bless them, and give us more workers for the harvest. And thank God for them praying for those serving in the military. Lord, we keep them safe as well as their way at drills even now, I believe. So we've got many folks to pray for. Brother Tim, why don't you come on up here? You won't remember all those names, but we want the church family to know you'd be praying for them. But Brother Tim, I ask him to say a word about the camp up there, how long they've been going, how long he's been there. And then he's going to pray for us as we open up the service. Good to see everybody tonight. Good to see Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I had it written down, Elizabeth Farmer on my note, but I had to mark that out. Elizabeth Sandridge is back there. So uh, we don't want to get in trouble with Nick, do we? So don't tell him I said the other name. So uh, good to have Elizabeth home for a little while. And uh, it's good to see each of you tonight. Thank you for being here. Brother Tim, why don't you greet the folks for us, please? Thank you. All right. It's great to be here. We were here back in uh, December, I believe it was, or January. I'm not sure which the time. It was December. And uh, we were, our family was about to face uh, one of those, uh, you know, everybody has something to go through. And I was facing a pretty major surgery. And uh, in March, we had that. Kind of didn't know how some things were going to happen and uh, work. And uh, your church was a huge blessing to us and love offering that we were in a place we needed, it, looking for surgery coming up and we needed that. And then, and, and had some folks say, we're gonna be praying for you, gonna be praying for you. I just can't tell you how much that means. And as somebody coming in, a stranger from nowhere and having folks in church willing to say, I'm gonna be praying for you, I care about you, I'm gonna be praying for you, sending love offering, stuff like that. I mean, it's just crazy stuff. And then we were extremely blessed. I got to watch, stuck at home after surgery, couldn't do anything. Got to watch you guys online and those, uh, man, here in the congregation singing those songs, you know, that just, 
You can't replace that with anything else and getting to hear the preaching of the Word of God. So anyway, y'all been a great blessing to us. We've been there about, uh, this, we just finished our 12th summer season, and uh, most of the time people don't survive that long at camp. I don't know if there's something wrong with my brain or what. <laughs> a lot of suggestions on that. But anyway, <laughs> like I said, the camp's been around 50 years now. What we were 50 years ago is what we still are today. Uh, our standards are still the same. Preaching's still the same. And uh, uh, so anyway, <laughs> still ripping faces off. Hey, man, I'm having a great time doing it. So uh, anyway, I'm just, I'm kind of kidding, but not. But anyway, so uh, we should. <laughs> but uh, it's camp, right? Camp's different. And uh, getting set apart. I love that, getting set apart. Those young people getting a week, those, just those four and a half days there to just say, Okay, Lord, what do you want? Get away from all that other stuff and this thing and all those things. And it's good for the adults too, amen. Well, anyway, sure to appreciate you all. Just want to say thank you to you all and the pastor. And uh, so anyway, let's have a word of prayer. Father, do thank you so much, Lord, for uh, our ability to be in a church service tonight. Lord, what a privilege it is to be able to sit under the preaching of the word of God, be able to sing together and worship you together and uh, all the parts of it. And Lord, tonight we have some of the church families been uh, mentioned that are going through some um, uh, struggles, some physical problems and other situations. And Lord, we pray for your uh, great power and working in their lives, even tonight, Lord, as they have been lifted up in name and now in prayer, we ask you to uh, uh, cover these, Lord, and, and uh, work and, and put your hand that they just know your hands at work and uh, guiding, helping, directing, healing, whatever's needed there. Lord, we know you can supply any need. And uh, so we pray you do that. We pray for your blessing tonight, even on the service, Lord. We're so excited to get to the Word of God tonight. So we pray you bless that. And thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've, we're blessed tonight. Uh, Brother Tom Green's been a friend for years, and I thank God for him and the ministry that he has not only pastoring that ministry, but then he also uh, labors in a dual ministry as well with Direct Line Ministries, and we're thankful for him. I'm going to ask him to slip up and just, if you need to set up this video and tell him a little bit about it, and then he's going to turn over, we'll watch this video, and then we'll come back and sing another song. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate it. I'm so happy here at uh, the Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church. I'm very thankful. I think years ago, my wife and I got married 31 years ago, and I think, I don't know why we came through here, uh, and uh, we sat way back in the back, I believe maybe even in a balcony, and, and we visited, and, and that's been many years ago. The church looks beautiful. You've done a great job here, and, and none of you look any different. All of you look the same. <laughs> And so I just wanted you to know that. Uh, my name is Tom Green. I'm a pastor of Temple Baptist Church in Statesboro, Georgia, down by Savannah. And uh, we also are leading the Direct Line Ministry. Direct Line Ministry is a ministry that sends containers of scriptures around the world. And so you hear folk uh, printing scriptures, but what happens after that? Well, they've got to be distributed. And so we ship containers in the last couple of years, we've shipped, uh, the last two years, we've shipped 20 containers, over 3 million scriptures around the world. And uh, I said 3 million scriptures around the world. Okay, thank you, good, I like it, participation. And, uh, but I'm telling you, it's exciting to see what the Lord is doing. And I'm so thrilled about it. How many know faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? Everybody needs the word of God and that's what we do. We also, during the Christmas season, we uh, put Christmas joy bags together. I know a group of yours uh, does that here and you've been doing that. And I just wanted to, I asked pastor, I've known him for several years. I said, hey, could I just come by and say thank you? And I just want to say thank you because every one of those Christmas joy bags goes to a missionary. They never stay at the warehouse. They go to places like Papua New Guinea and other places. You'll see on the video where they go. The video is about four minutes and 14 seconds long. It's very detailed. It gives you an idea about what we do. You'll see our warehouse. I'd also like to invite you to consider coming down. October the 5th, we're calling it our National uh, Christmas Joy Bag Volunteer Day. Several churches are going to be coming, and we'll be making sure that all the Christmas Joy Bags have a John and Romans in them, and that they're properly boxed and ready to go. And we've seen so many great things that video will share with you about what we're doing. So, so first, I want to say thank you. I really mean that. All of these bags, we've seen so many good things happen. I have emails from missionaries that tell me that so many of their children and even parents are, have gotten saved as a result of the missionaries going into these places and giving out their joy bags and then also preaching the word of God and people coming to Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. Amen. It's not baptism. It's not my works. 
It's not the things we do at Direct Line Ministry. It's the power of God. It's the gospel, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The only way they're going to get is through God's word. And uh, so this is just a tool that we use, and it's a great tool. Uh, you'll see more about that in the video. So thank you, Pastor. I really appreciate it. And just think about what you could do, maybe more, or just pray for us and uh, be a part of what's going on. Again, thank you, church, for what you've done with the joy bags. God bless you. Thank you. About 120 churches come together and they put Christmas joy bags together during the early fall. We pick them up. We bring them here and we put scripture booklets in them and we pack them and get them ready to go around the world. About 8,000 joy bags will be going out to different missionaries around the world and their children in their ministries will receive them as well as children they've never been able to speak to, but a gift will open the heart of a child and a parent for the gospel. And so that's why we do this. We see great things every year, great stories every year about children coming to Christ and also their parents. The Christmas joy bags contain school supplies, hygiene items, toys, uh, little treats for the kids, and all of them contain a scripture booklet. These are things that they have never had before. And for the first time, they're getting a scripture booklet. For the first time, they're getting their own toothbrush. So this is a big deal to them. I've been on both sides of the mission field. I've passed them out and I've watched the joy on the children's faces. Some of the kids are just happy to get a toothbrush because they say, now I don't have to share my family toothbrush or even get a, the hygiene item in the joy bag, which is the body wash. So it's like things that we take for granted. It, it's a blessing for those kids to get around the world. One of the greatest blessings that we receive every year is we'll get missionaries that call us back and say, hey, we were able to go into a new village, we were able to go into a new area, we've never been before, and they are open to the gospel. A lot of times a particular religion will be in charge of that area and they won't let Christians in. But when you come with gifts and you come with the love of God in your heart and uh, things for children, it's hard for the leaders of that village to say no. We've had churches start through these joy bags in, in places like Mexico, pretty amazing. We've helped orphanages where children don't have anything and uh, living on dirt floors and we're able to give them a Christmas joy bag. It influences people in a good way and knowing that the gospel is going around the world and that churches have been started out of this, it's a, it's a really good thing. There'll be about 8,000 joy bags that'll go out this year. We're looking at about 11 different countries or so. They'll go to countries like Honduras, Mexico, the Philippines, Papua New Guinea. These go all over the world. Our biggest need for joy bags is obviously more joy bags. I have more missionaries than I have joy bags to be able to take care of what they're asking for. People can get involved with the joy bags through either giving online at a website and then we can put the joy bags together with the money that they donated or we also go to church and we can train them how to do the joy bags through that way. We also love to have volunteers come and help just like today. We had probably 30, 35 people here today. It's a really good time of fellowship as well by doing a really good project. So we have kids from as young as seven and eight all the way up to senior citizens helping put these joy bags together. And these joy bags are not hard to do. They're pretty easy. So it's a great way to just volunteer some time and get involved in this. God called us to serve Him. And I think it just was one of those moments where I realized that I needed to be more involved in missions. Just look around you. Why not? It's an amazing door. God's open doors. There are many adversaries, but yet God keeps us going and God supplies and God uses local churches. We couldn't do it without the, the local church jumping in, taking care of the finances, taking care of, of the needs of the church and the missionaries. Your help makes a big difference in the lives of so many people in getting the gospel into hands who have never had the gospel before. And people are getting saved, churches are being started, so thank you so much for your work and your giving. It touches the heart and it brings joy to a child. Thank you, and please get involved in doing the Christmas Joy gift bags. It's a blessing to children around the world.
opportunity. I wanted Brother Green to be here to just present to the whole church. Different ones of you have helped over the years in these joy bags, but I'd like just to open it up to everybody. If you'd like to get involved with it, it's just us. He'll, he can give the, I, I slipped out to get something, but maybe put the cost in there. If not, you can kind of fill me in how much, and we, we can help with the postage to get it there as well and all the shipping and whatnot. But I'd like for all of you to consider if that would be something the Lord would have you uh, take part of because that's just helping somebody. And it won't be one where you get to see him open up and all those things. I get that. But we're just going to trust it to the Lord and let him use it in the lives of people. And then those each one were gospel opportunities to get that gospel where it needs to go. So I'm excited about it and trust that you'll get involved with it. And uh, he'll share more about that when he preaches, I know, and give you the word of God as well. Well, right now, though, let's stand together. If you're able to, hymn number 534 the longer I serve him since I started for the kingdom since my life he controls <coughs> I want you to think about when you get down there to the end the longer I serve him I talk to so many saints of God who have been serving Jesus for a long time and they say all the sentiments of this course he just gets better and better and sweeter and sweeter I haven't met the old saint on on their near their passing to say the Lord's done me wrong they say he's been so faithful I haven't always been faithful to him but he's been faithful to me since I started for the kingdom let's sing together brother Stephen since I started sweeter and sweeter we realize more and more how good you are to us thank you lord i pray that you would bless now this time as we get to give I pray that you take it and use it for your glory in jesus name amen you may be seated going to continue the theme of proclaiming Christ tonight by number 565, Send the Light. 
We're going to send the light, and I hope that's your prayer tonight, that we can send the light. And that's what Brother Green's doing, is uh, telling us about tonight. So number 565. There's a call comes ringing on the as I failed to do this earlier. One week from tonight, it was a late uh, development, but Brother Kenny Baldwin's going to be coming through the area, and I think going over to Pigeon Forge maybe for family vacation, but he's going to come and preach for us, and I'd like to have you come. He did such a wonderful job at our revival, and I'd like for you to come next Wednesday night and be here and invite folks to be with you, and also, if you sing in the choir, we'll tell more about it Sunday, but I'd like to have the choir sing. I'd like to just give him a taste of good old-fashioned uh, Northeast Tennessee uh, gospel singing and we'll have a good time singing together and then we'll have a fun service and he'll be with us and then he'll just head on back to vacation and so I, I want you to see if you can get as many folks here as you can we'll have a good time next Sunday or next Wednesday night one week from tonight and we'll we'll just suffer through Tom Green tonight but next week we'll really have a preacher in here and uh, now nah, that's that's only partly true so I, I want you to know that uh, now um, we appreciate uh, the chance to have Brother Green. He's a blessing. Let me give you another few announcements. Ladies, uh, the Bible study begins on August 29th. Those books are $10. You can see Amy tonight in the lobby afterwards. The topic is contentment. And uh, so you'll have a wonderful time. I know if you want to get one of those and get ready for it, it'd be a great joy to you. And then also for the ladies conference coming up on September 20th and 21st, Francie Taylor and Sharon Rabin will be here. And uh, it's going to be a great time, ladies. You don't want to miss that. There's information back in the lobby and I challenge you to be there. It will really, really help your spiritual walk. Amy always enjoys hearing these ladies. And then the last one, um, oh, second to last one, last one is tomorrow. There's a back to school ladies prayer walk. It's uh, 7 p.m. here at the church. You just come on in. They'll give you instructions and uh, pray for some folks as they get uh, uh, back to school is talking with uh, Brother Brick and Nancy Hall. We were fellowshipping today some and just talking about even their family, their son-in-law, grandkids, somebody starting uh, tomorrow or next day and somebody next Monday and just it's all starting. There's a lot going on. So we need to be praying for one another at this time. And so ladies, if you can be here tomorrow, I know that you would enjoy that. And then the last one, don't forget that 245th birthday that's coming up August 18th to identical services, 845 and 11. We have a great time and we're looking forward to all of it. So I just want to keep you up to date on those. Well, uh, Brother Tom Green is a good friend. All jokes aside, he and I have fellowship together and we thank God for him. And uh, he uh, has served with Direct Line Ministries for years, uh, but uh, in, in more recent years, he has taken on the leadership role of it, and I'm thanking the Lord for him. And uh, just as a little trivia note, uh, this is the ministry Brother John Young has served with. For how long, Brother John? When did you start helping with Direct Line? eight years ago and so we thank God for him and uh, the ministry and so it's a joy to have a good friend if it wasn't a good friend we wouldn't joke with him brother green why don't you come preach for us and uh, guys
going to use this handheld number two, and so we'll get him started right there. Amen. Well, we were good friends, but not anymore. And so uh, I know why the church is so good. He never preaches here. So uh, seriously, do you want to go there, brother? I apologize. Yeah, I quit. As long as I keep the love offering, I'm out of here. Come on. <laughs> Young, uh, it's good to see you. I, I was uh, I was going to say he stole my thunder just a little bit, but uh, they served the Lord with Direct Line Ministry many years ago, and he was one of the first guys that we met. And we had had a we didn't get to stay together very much, but the time we were together, he was such a blessing, and and I had a good time. They even took us over to their house, and we ate one night. I don't know if you remember all that, and uh, it was good. Nobody got sick, and it was a blessing. And I'm just kidding you. We all got sick, and so uh, it was. I'm just kidding you. I apologize. You started it. You started it. Uh, it's his fault. I'm, and I'm like that. And I'm the most on. I'm, I'm, how many of you are kind of like honorary? Would you raise your hand? I fit right in, man. I, I battle it. I really do. The Bible talks about foolish jesting, you know. It's not foolish if it's good. Amen. And, uh, but anyway, thank you, church, for doing that. Now, let me just tell you just real quick, and I'm going to honor the time pastor said you've never been here past 1030. And so we're going to honor that tonight. I'm just kidding you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he said 8 o'clock after that, the lights start turning out. So we'll, we'll work it out. Uh, let me just tell you real quick. On the back table, there's a couple things. If you'd like to sign up for one of our emails, I'd love for you to do that. Uh, we, do, we send out, we try to do it monthly. And then also we send videos, different things like that. There's a joy bag brochure that you can pick up and look at. And uh, it tells the details on there. And I know some of you are already do, doing those. And you can ask the folks that are already doing it. But these are great. So he asked, preacher I mentioned about the cost. What we do, typically, a, a typical joy bag will be about $16 to put together in the United States. You can also go online if you have a burden for Mexico. I, I'll try, I talk fast. I'll try to slow down a little bit. But um, if you'd like to do that, we are actually going to put them together in Mexico this year. The first time we've ever done anything like this. We have property in Saltillo, Mexico, and I'll tell you about that in just a moment. But what we're doing is, uh, if you'd like to go online and do that, you can build one online. They're a little bit more. They're about $23 online just because the price difference from Mexico to the United States. We ask that you put, along with that, $6 with these bags. And the reason why is because we, can, we ship them for that. You couldn't ship a one joy bag to Honduras for $6. You couldn't do it. I can, but you couldn't do it. Uh, we have distributor, uh, distributors and, and folks we work with all over uh, Miami and different places to get them there. But that joy bag would cost you about $40 to get there, and it may or may not get there. And so um, we can do that because we do it in bulk, and we've been doing it for several years. So that's why that's there is uh, the cost of that. We don't keep that for uh, any other reason than working with joy bags and all that goes on with those joy bags. Also, I want to mention to you on the back table, there is a, uh, there's a brochure. This is a new one now. So uh, this is uh, our Saltillo ministry there in uh, Saltillo, Mexico. And we have property there. There's a place there where we're going to begin to uh, work with church planters in Mexico. We're going to be doing some interns, interns for and teaching and training there. And Brother Tim Card is going to lead that, and uh, that's going to be such a blessing. I hope you'll take time to look at that. Just a couple more things real quick. Uh, there's a brochure back there that tells what Direct Line is all about and what we do, and that kind of helps you out. We help missionaries. Uh, we, we help independent Baptist missionaries, and, uh, and, of course, they line up doctrinally with what you would line up with as far as the, the, the version of the Bible they use and soul winning. We're not Calvinists and all that stuff, so we do that. Also, I wanted to mention to you there's a prayer card there if you'd like to pick that up and uh, put it where you, wherever you can think about us and pray about us. If you pray about the ministry there, if you would, please. If you'd like to get involved with Direct Line, let me know. And, of course, we always talk to pastor about folks that like to get involved. And so if that's something you're interested in, it would be an honor to have you come down and check things out and see what's going on there. So the Lord is working, and uh, I just thank the Lord for it. I'm just glad to be a part of what he's doing, and it's just a thrill. And when you know you're in God's will, it settles everything else. And the burdens and battles come, but you say, no, I'm in the will of God. I'm right where I need to be, and it settles everything. Are you in the will of God? Do you know God's will for your life? It settles everything. It really does. And uh, I'm thanking God for it. You got your Bible there? Let's stand and turn to the book of Acts, chapter 1, would you please, this evening? Acts chapter 1. And let's stand, if you're able to, and we're going to read a few verses here. Acts chapter 1. And uh, I want to read this to you, and then we're going to look at a couple things here in this passage of Scripture. In Acts chapter 1, 
And uh, I want you to pray with me that the Lord will speak through this message this evening as we look in Acts chapter 1, and then maybe we'll go to the book of Luke here in just a moment. I won't be long, I, I promise you that. I'm praying that the Lord will speak to us as we hear his word tonight. I appreciate you being here tonight. It's an honor to stand in this pulpit, so thank you, Pastor. I truly mean that. I appreciate it very, very much. If you found the book of Acts and you're in chapter 1, would you say amen? amen? Notice the Bible says, beginning in verse number 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou that this time restore again the kingdom of Israel, or kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went, behold, he went up, behold, two men stood by him in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven." Then returned they into Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. That's two-thirds of a mile, 200 cubits. And uh, when they were come in, they went up into an upper room and where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simeon or Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James, these all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. I want you to notice, if you would please, this question that's rhetorical, found in verse number 11. Well, the word of God says, the angels say, why stand ye gazing into heaven? Would you say that with me? Why stand ye gazing into heaven? With the help of the Holy Spirit of God, I want to speak to you on this question, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? I want to answer the question, why they were gazing into heaven. Can we pray together? Our Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for the testimony of this good church. I thank you for Pastor Herdman and his family and all that you're doing through them. I thank you for the folks that are here tonight and some, many unfamiliar, but Lord Jesus, we thank you that... You're the great common denominator that when we know Jesus, we have a great big family and we thank God for it. And tonight, I pray that you'd speak through me. You know exactly the details of my life. And you know the details of every person here and what we need and what we don't need. So God, speak to me. Help me. Do what I cannot do. Speak to hearts for the next few moments in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. It had been just 40 days since the horrible events of Calvary had taken place. The Lord Jesus Christ suffered his uh, Calvary experience for our sins. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Sadly, as we look at Calvary, we see that many of the disciples left him. John stayed around. Some of the ladies stayed around. But the other disciples abandoned him. But when they abandoned him, he did not abandon them. And the Bible tells us here now, he's called them and he's working with them for 40 days. He's telling them about the kingdom and what God is doing and what they're supposed to do. And then he says, I want you to wait. There's a, a promise that I'm going to give. And I, I want you to wait. In verse number four, he said, wait for the promise of the father, which saith he, ye, ye have heard of me. And for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Well, the day came when the Lord Jesus Christ on the Mount of Olives would begin to ascend up into heaven and 10 feet and 15 feet and 20 feet and 30 feet and on up into the clouds. The Lord Jesus ascends out of their sight and they stand there and riveted at what they're seeing 
as their Savior, the one who they'd given themselves to for three and a half years, the one who they'd seen open up blinded eyes, the one that they'd seen uh, feed the multitudes, the one that they'd seen stop funeral processions and, and heal the sick and the lame and, and do many miracles, that one that they'd loved and they listened to him teach and, and they had been changed because of him and how he restored them after they had abandoned him after Calvary, that's the one that they see ascending up into heaven. I, I say to you why they were gazing into heaven is because that's the one they love. Thomas could have said something like this. I'll tell you why I'm gazing at him. He's the one that loved me when I said I don't believe him. If I see, if, unless I see the scars in his hands and in his side, I, I will not believe. That's the one who came to me and said, Thomas, be not faithless, but believe. That's the one ascending into heaven. Matthew could have said something like this. He's the one that came to me when I was a tax collector and nobody loved me and I was stealing from my own country, giving to the Roman Empire and I had no purpose. Oh, I had money and I had things, but I didn't have happiness. And he came and said, I want you to put all that down and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And, and Matthew's life was changed forever because Jesus met him there. And I want to tell you that Matthew could have said, that's the one who, who gave Gave me reason to live. Simon Zelotus could have said something like this. Before I met him, I wanted to kill every Roman. I was ready to dispatch every Roman official that I could ever get my hands upon. He wanted to kill every Roman uh, so soldier and citizen out of Jerusalem, uh, zealous for his country. And uh, Jesus came along and changed him and said, that's not the real purpose of life. The real purpose of life is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and take up your cross and to follow him. And Simon Zelotus could have said something like this. He gave me the real purpose in life. He gave me the real reason to live. There he goes. That's the one. That's why I'm gazing into heaven. It could have been James that would have said something like this. He could have said, well, I met him and, and he stopped by the boat one day when my daddy was there and, uh, and uh, my brother was there and he began to speak to us and he called us out of the boat to follow him and uh, the sons of Zebedee leave the boat and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And he could have said, he gave me reason beyond the boat, beyond the family business, beyond what I knew in this life would bring me what I thought would at least be some kind of contentment. It's all gone because I met Jesus Christ. He's my new hope. He's my new reason for living. He's my new purpose. It could have been that John, why stand you gazing up into heaven? It's because he's the one that loved me. Remember, he's the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was the one that laid his breast, uh, his head on the breast of the Lord Jesus Christ and heard the very heartbeat of Jesus Christ the last night that he would live upon the earth as far as before Calvary's concerned. And uh, he's the one that was close, Peter, James, and John being close and being intimate with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can see with tears in his eyes as he gazed up into heaven, as he watched Jesus Christ riveted at what he sees as the Son of God ascends. It could have been that Peter, of all disciples standing there, he could have said, there goes the one that I betrayed. There goes the one that I, the night when he needed me the most, in the moment of crisis, when I should have stood up for him. And, and I, I, instead, I, I, I said, I don't know him. And I didn't just say it once. I said it twice. And, and then the third time, I, I don't even know him. And it could have been that Peter, when he was restored, aren't you glad God restores? Say Amen. I mean, the Bible says that Jesus, uh, God, uh, excuse me, the angel came and said to those disciples, I want you to go tell to his disciples and Peter that Jesus is risen. I'm glad for those two words, and Peter, aren't you? I'm glad that Jesus Christ comes and he restores. And you may be here tonight and you may think that your life is beyond reach. You may think that uh, you've stumbled into this place thinking there is no hope for me. There is no help for me. Listen to me this last two weeks. In the last two weeks, I've heard of two people that have committed suicide call themselves Christians they said there was no hope for them let me tell you something I don't know what they were thinking about and my heart breaks for them and one of them was a pastor's wife and my heart goes out to that family and I don't know what was going on but I know this my dear friend if that's something on your thoughts I beg you tonight look unto Jesus he wants to help you he wants to give you strength he wants you to turn your heart to him it's not worth that selfish decision to give yourself up to suicide my friend Jesus Jesus can give you hope. 
I say to you, Peter could have said, that's my Savior who stopped and said, Simon, do you love me? And I want you to feed my sheep and, and feed my lambs. And he, he sort of reinstated me into the ministry. Peter, you don't know it. We know it because we know the Bible. But Peter, you don't know it. But in just a few days, you're going to stand at Pentecost. And you're going to preach. And 3,000 people are going to be saved. And the Spirit of God is going to pour out upon that place. And uh, many people will come to Christ. If you take your finger and put it on Jerusalem. And every country that's mentioned and nation that's mentioned. It is a 1,500 mile radius all around Jerusalem and Peter was the one who preached the word of God under the power of the Holy Spirit and those people got saved at Pentecost 3,000 of them and what was launched was something that has changed the entire world no wonder they were gazing up there no wonder they looked up and they saw their Savior but the angels said why why are you gazing into heaven so I have to turn this around just a little bit. I know why they were gazing up into heaven. You remember when you first got married or you saw that one that you thought that you were going to marry? Hello? Don't go to sleep yet. It's, not, it's only 745. Do you, you, you remember how you gazed at each other? Now you can't, how you still gaze at each other? Oh, now you're laughing, huh? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you remember how it used to be when you'd stare at each other and you'd the googly eyes and you, oh, she's so beautiful. Oh, he's so handsome and et cetera, et cetera. I've never, personally never met a handsome guy. But anyway, the point is this, except for one, but you can figure that out later. But what I'm trying to say, my friends, is this, that you gazed because you were intently amazed. You, you were in love. But now there's something that has to happen. You see, Jesus isn't there anymore. Oh, he's going to be there in the person of the Holy Spirit. I know that. And the Holy Spirit is coming in John 14, 15, and 16. He tells us over and over that the Comforter is coming and he will live with us. And how many are you glad that when you get saved, you become the temple of the Holy Ghost and he lives inside of you? Amen. Aren't you glad you're never alone? There's always that other one with you. Somebody who loves you and cares for you. I'm grateful for that. And God the Father and God the Holy Spirit and God the Son, co-equal, co-existent. And I thank God for that wonderful truth. But the disciples are standing there staring and the angels have to say, hold on a minute, fellas. You can't live gazing up there forever. Something has to change because the truth of the matter is you've got to go back down to Jerusalem. You've got to live on the earth. He's gone. Yes, the Holy Spirit's coming. Don't misunderstand me. But Jesus and his ministry on earth was finished. I know he's going to heaven. He's going to be sitting at the right hand of the Father. He'll be our intercessor. He'll be our advocate. Amen. He'll be the one that stands there and says, yes, I know those rascals did what they did, but they've been blood bought and they've been bought by the precious price of my blood. And they're my children and they're your children, God. Aren't you glad we have an advocate with the Father? But that's where he's at. They've got to go back into Jerusalem. Stay with me now. They've got to go back into Jerusalem. And I want you to think about this, my friends. They've got to go back to reality. <laughs> They've got to go back to the grind. They've got to go back to the fear that those men who hated Christ may come after them very soon. Perhaps they think that they're on the Jerusalem's top ten most wanted and they think to themselves, we're not going to be able to make it. We find them in an upper room waiting and praying. But I want you to think with me, friends, just for a moment. They, go, they have to go back. I want to tell you why they need to go back. Here's why they need to go back. They need to go back because somebody in the world needs to hear the message of the gospel. Somebody needs to hear that Jesus loved him and died for him and was buried and rose again. Somebody needs to tell him. And the Bible said, Jesus said, listen to me. Uh, it's not time for you to figure out the eschatology of things. It, uh, so what if you, it, it's not time for you to know when Jesus is coming. That's not the point. Here's what he's teaching. He's saying, look, you go back and be a witness. My friend, we live in a day and age where we watch the news and we think Israel's in trouble. Jesus is coming, the kingdom and all this kind of thing. And they get, everybody gets all nervous about it. Let me tell you the next prophetic event on God's calendar is the rapture of the church my friend and so I'm not looking for another war over there they can fight all they want Jesus is still coming again 
And he's going to set up his kingdom and all that he said he's going to do is going to take place after the tribulation. And I'm just trying to tell you, my dear friend, okay, so we, it's just like this. We come to church and on Sunday morning we get excited and we hear the good songs and we go home saying, yes, it's true. The, the longer I serve him, the, the sweeter he grows. And tell me the story of Jesus and, and you're encouraged by the choir and you're encouraged by the preaching and you're encouraged by the Sunday school lesson and you're encouraged by the, fr- the fellowship and all that goes on. But you've got to go to work on Monday. It's good to be up on the mountaintop and see Jesus in all of his glory on Sunday, but you've got to live it on Monday. That's the point. Why are you standing here gazing? My friend, what we learn on Sunday, we're supposed to take into Monday. Now, I know it's a little bit of ear, but when I bend it, you should say amen. Let's try that. Thank you, three of you. God bless you. You see, what happens is people get the idea that church is, 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 is just for church. It's not for Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. My dear friend, church ought to be the icing on the cake. We ought to be in God's word and praying and, and walking with God in the morning. And so that when and the afternoon comes or that, that job comes or dealing with the children come, I'm trying to tell you, my friend, that we ought to be ready to go. And we can't just gaze at what we've seen. We've got to go do something about it. Notice the Bible says here, you're going to receive power. Man, I'm glad we receive power. This is a dynamic ability that God gives to us to be a witness. It's interesting that the word witness has the idea of a martyr. Now listen to me, my friend. You may be called to be a martyr, but I would say in America, most of us will never, probably all of us in this room will not experience that. God may not call us to, be a, to live a martyr's death, but he may call us to live a martyr's life. To die to self. It may take something like some tragedy to get our attention. But God wants to work in you to show you that his power is greater than your power. And he wants to do something mighty and, and wonderful through your life. And he says, I'm, going to, I'm willing to give you power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses. Not only that, but he says to live in the promise. You go back. Live in his power and live in the promise. Ye shall be witnesses. Ye shall receive power. How many know God keeps his word? Every word from the beginning to the end, God keeps his word. Every word of God is true. He's a shield on them to put their trust in him. God's word can be trusted. Amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light in my path. I will hide it in his words in my heart that I might not sin against God. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even unto the dividing of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Thank God for the word of God. All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I'm saying to you, God gave them a promise and you can't go up on the mountain and forever you've got to come back down and now you've got to live in that power and and you've got to live in his promises but I want you to see something here the Bible says in all Judea and Samaria Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria the most parts of the earth and Jerusalem was pretty easy that's where they were standing Judea that would be a little further out and notice if you would please He uses Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. You know, Christ had a a love for Samaria. You remember the Samaritan woman at the well? He went to her, and he said, if you knew who you were asking for water from, you'd ask me for water. And he said he was the living water. And you remember how she went to the city and said, come see a man who has told me all things. Is not this the Christ? He had a love for Samaria. Great revival took place. But Samaritans were hated by the Jews. And say they were considered what half Jew and half Gentile. It was the Assyrians that had placed those Gentiles in that part of the world many years before. And they had intermingled, intermingled with the Jews. And now they're a half Jew and a half Gentile. And, and uh, they worshipped a different God completely all together. And, uh, and uh, we know that during this time they, they hated each other. And I want you to hear this. The Jews were racist and prejudiced against them. And let me say this to you. The Lord Jesus Christ breaks down every barrier. You listen to me, my friend. You cannot 
be the Christian God wants you to be unless you say, for God so loved the world. Every soul needs a Savior. Even the ones that we're against. I'm not for what's going on on the border. And I'm not for what's going on in the Middle East. And I'm not for what's going on in the Ukraine. And I'm not for this and that and the other. And you probably, maybe most of us would agree that there's lots of problems. But let me tell you something. Every soul that we see on the television, Christ died for. Every one of them. Every one. What are we going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Adrian Rogers is a great Southern Baptist preacher. I'm not Southern Baptist. I'm independent, so don't be mad at me. He told this story about a lady that called him, and he said to her, uh, she said to him in frantic, she, he knew her, a good member of the church. She cried, Pastor, Pastor, my, my daddy's in hell. My daddy's in hell. He said, hold on, what are you talking about? What do you mean your daddy's in hell? My daddy died today. He's in hell. And Adrian Rogers said, no, he's not. She said, you, you, don't, you don't understand. He's in hell. I know he's in hell. And Adrian Rogers said, listen, he's not in hell. He said, last Thursday, God woke me up and I had a burden and his name came to my mind. He said, I went to his house, Adrian Rogers. He said, I got in a car and went to his house. I sat down with the man laying in a bed. He said, I opened my little Bible and showed him how to be saved. And your daddy trusted Christ as his savior. And then he said this, did you ever tell him? And there was silence on the other end. See, she could come to church and hear the good singing and she could gaze at Jesus at church. Oh, let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And I'm for that. Oh, let us give God the glory and raise our hands. And I'm for that. And let's all shout and say glory to God and hallelujah. And I'm for it. And I, let's run around. I'm not sure if I'm for that. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of people that know how to do something on Sunday in church because they've seen people do it. But when it comes to really living the Christian life on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it just makes you wonder, are you just gazing? And Jesus said, that's not what I want anymore. I, you've got to go back and be filled with the power of God and be a witness for me. Yesterday, we have church on Tuesdays because we're weird. Yesterday we had church on Tuesday, and uh, that makes no sense, does it? You know, you know Tuesday was Tuesday? I'm pretty smart. And uh, you don't get me, and that's okay. You'll get it later. Uh, so there was a, a girl that's been coming, a young lady. She sat back right about over here. Her name's Mackenzie. A sweet little girl. My son had invited her. She's probably 22, 23 years of age, whatever. She's old enough to be my daughter. She's been sitting over here. She's even brought a couple family members over the last couple months. And, and she carried a Bible and she carried a notebook. She took notes. I assumed she was saved. And my, my wife said, hey, I heard Mackenzie can make some, uh, some cupcakes. And we've got a preacher's fellowship next week. And I said, she, my wife said, we need to make cupcakes. Very nice, special cupcakes for these guys, whatever. I said, you're the boss. And so uh, I went over to, to McKenzie. I said, and my, my wife came over. I said, hey, I, we heard a rumor about you. We heard that you, you uh, make cupcakes. And she said, yeah. She said, I make cupcakes. And my wife said, I heard they're pretty professional. She said, well, yeah, I do a pretty good job with them. And she's talking about it a little bit. And something prompted me. And I said, McKenzie, let me ask you a question. I said, McKenzie, are you saved? She'd been coming to our church for several months. Carrying a Bible, taking notes, singing with us. Mackenzie, are you saved? And she said, no, but I've been wanting to talk to you about that. And then she blew my mind, excuse the expression. She pulled out her phone and she said, I was going to text you. And she showed me the text that she was going to say, hey, pastor, I want to talk to you about how to get saved. She said, I was too afraid to send it, but it's right here. My wife's standing there. She showed it to us. I said, sit down. I opened up my Bible and I showed her from God's word how she can be saved. And that Mackenzie bowed her head and asked Jesus Christ to forgive her sin and be her savior right there on the pew. 
Did you know people can get saved? It doesn't even have to be altar call time. <laughs> She's supposed to get baptized Sunday. She texted me and she said, I can't wait to work with your wife about these cupcakes. And I'm, my mom's coming. I'm going to get baptized on Sunday. And I'm excited to be able to. I hope she does it I, so she doesn't ruin my story. I'm just, I'm just simply trying to say that, that she came to church and gazing up into heaven and still missing the whole point. If you're here tonight and you do not know Christ is your Savior, please stop playing the game. Do you realize you're a heartbeat away from going to hell if you're not saved? May I remind you of something? The angel said, why stand you gazing? Let me tell you one more thing. It's 7.59. That's not the other thing I want to tell you. I have to say this. And you, you have to forgive me. God called me to do what I'm doing. God gave me a pastor's heart. And I've seen this. And pastor, you've seen it too. And I'm winding all this up. So just hear me now. There's some of you in this room who've gone through great tragedy You've been mishandled, mistreated. You lost a loved one. Something has happened. And you've spent years gazing at something that's not there anymore. They don't misunderstand me. We love their memory and we appreciate what was. And we go back and sometimes we weep. We sorrow, but not as those who have no hope. And we go back and we reminisce and we, we go back in our memory and remember how wonderful it is. But why are you gazing at something that's gone? You've got more life to live. God left you here on purpose. You have a reason to be here. I know it hurts and I know you're, you're broken hearted and I know it's deep. And you might even think, preacher, you have no right to talk like that. And I may even agree with you. But God prompted me, when I put this thought together, God prompted me to say, tell somebody, I still love them, but they have more life to live. They've got to get up and go on. When Moses died, they, they mourned for him for 40 days, and, and then they had to get up and go on. And I wonder how many of them said, boy, I sure wish Moses was here. But God didn't want Moses there anymore. God wanted Moses with him. And God wanted Joshua to take the children of Israel into the land of promise. I can't do this anymore because they're not here anymore. Well, maybe God's given you the strength if you'll learn to trust him. My mother, my dad died when I was 10 years of age. He died of a brain tumor. There's a man at our church that has struggled with that. And I'm, I'm praying for him because I know what he's going through. I was just a little boy when he died, and my mother basically raised us in kind of a rough area, a ghetto area. She did the best she could, I guess. And I loved her dearly. I know this might sound strange, but I thought my mother was the most beautiful lady I'd ever met. I loved my mother. Every year I, before she died, she died in September this year. Every year I would text her and I would say, uh uh, during Father's Day, I would text her and say, Happy Father's Day. And she'd say, she'd text me back and say, What's wrong with you? You know I'm not your dad. And I said, But Mom, you had to be Mom and Dad to me. Thank you. In September, she died. They, she had her, her appendix burst, and they thought they'd fixed everything, but everything went wrong, and she died. Beautiful singer, you should hear. She, preacher was talking about, she didn't need a mic. She could just sing. Beautiful. She sang, she sang like the old folk used to sing, not like people like now that feels like when they sing, it sounds like something's wrong with them. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I think it's a Wednesday night. You can handle that. But she sang, and man, she'd fill the room up. And uh, I was at a preacher's fellowship, and my sister said, if you want to talk to your mom, you, and I'd seen her two weeks before, I couldn't get back up there. She said, if you want to see her, you need to talk to her now. And, and they put the phone there. And I, I talked to her and told her I loved her and told her she was a beautiful lady. I wish I could hear her sing one more time. My sister said, Tom, they want, I'm sorry, my sister said, Dr. Green, they want, <laughs> they want you to do the funeral. And I said, I'd be honored to do that. I did my mother's funeral. 
I ask God for special grace to stand in front of my, fa- my mother's body and give the message. I talked about Paul singing in midnight in trials, but he kept singing. That was my mom's life. Just keep on singing. God will give you a song. Well, here's the point I want to make. The next Sunday, I had to get up and go preach. The next week, I had to go soul winning. The next Wednesday night, I had to go to church. I, you have to keep living. You have to keep going. And I miss her. Some of you in this room have dealt with loss like this. And God is teaching us. Please listen. Yes, it's okay to reminisce. But why stand you gazing when there's more to do down here? It's time to move forward. I don't know who that was for tonight. And honestly, this wasn't the message I was, supposed to, I was going to preach. If you looked at my notes right now, you'd find out. <laughs> I brought occupy till I come. <laughs> I brought the wrong message. But maybe I brought the right one. Because maybe someone in this room needs to say, okay, I'll get up. I'll go another day. Why stand you gazing? I'll tell you why we gaze, because we love him, amen? But he said, all right, come down. Let's go live what you saw up on the mountain. Father, thank you for your word. Lead us and guide us, I do pray. I pray that you would speak to every heart. Thank you for an opportunity to open up the word of God. What a precious book. I'm sure in this room tonight, God, there are people that are living in the past. And God, I pray that tonight we'd appreciate the past. We'd appreciate the memories. But God, we've got to move forward. And there's some broken-hearted person in this room who just couldn't, can't get over it. And tonight, I pray you'd wrap your loving arms around them and tell them it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Oh, God, do that for us. Maybe there's someone here tonight that's been playing church for a little while. And like my dear friend, little Mackenzie, she, they've been playing, they, they've been gazing, but they've never been born again. I pray tonight. They trust you as Savior. And one more thing, Lord. I pray that we would live what we hear and see. And as we stand in awe, as we worship corporately as a church, I pray that we would live all of that experience on Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We'd live what we're gazing at. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed just for a moment. I'll turn the message over to Preacher, in just a moment. How many say with an uplifted hand, Preacher, if I died tonight, I know for sure I'd go to heaven. Would you lift your hand, hold it high? I've done what the Bible says to be saved. Isn't it good to be saved? Amen? Maybe you're here tonight and you'd say, Preacher, I've never been born again. I don't know Christ. I want to be saved. Would you pray for me? I won't embarrass you. I won't call your name. I don't even know your name, but I want to pray for you. Would you say, Preacher, would you pray for me? I'm not sure that I'm born again. I'm not sure that I'm going to heaven when I die. Just slip your hand up and put it back down just so I can see it and pray for you. God bless you, sir. Is there someone else? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Here's what I would do if I were you. Dear friend, and wherever you're at, I'm not going to embarrass you. You have my word. In just a moment, when the piano starts to play, I'd slip out of my seat and come sit on this front row and let someone take the Bible and show you how to be saved. Now, here's what the devil's going to say. The devil's going to say something like this. Uh, what people think about me if I go forward, here's what they'll think. They'll think, praise the Lord. That's what they'll think. You ought to do that tonight. I'd do it now. I wouldn't wait. I'd get it settled tonight. If I knew, if I knew what hell was really like, I wouldn't, I'd run to this altar. I'd run. I'd say, I need to be born again. If you're here tonight and you'd say, preacher, I, there's something in my past and, I'm, and, and, and I've got to move forward. And it's not that I don't love the people in the past or not that I don't care for them, but I've, I've got to move forward so I can glorify God in my life. I've been stuck. Pray for me, preacher. You'd lift your hand, hold it high. Pray for me, preacher. Come on. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You know what you ought to do? You ought to find a place here and just pray and say, Lord, help me. Help me to surrender my heart to you. And one more thing, real quick. You're here tonight as the message was given. You say, you know, I've been playing around a little bit. I'm just here, you know, the good old boy thing. But I know in my heart there's a power that I need. I'm saved, but I need that power in my life. And I need to be that witness God's called me to be. 
And God is prompting me tonight. I need to do more for him. Would you lift your hand, hold it high? Pray for me, preacher. God bless you. Yeah, many hands. Oh, let's do business with the Lord tonight. Father, let thy will be done in Christ's name. Amen. Preacher, thank you. If you're able to stand together with us, just give folks a chance to get out. If you're here and you need to pray, I invite you to come. I'm standing down here at the front. Be glad to pray with you. If you're here tonight and you need to be born again, need to be saved, maybe you don't know all the terminology that's immaterial, but you know you need Jesus Christ, would you step out and come? Let me or someone take a Bible and show you how you can put your faith in Jesus Christ. Anyone at all, step out and come. Maybe there's some other need. There's many on this altar already. You want to come and join them. Are you gazing or are you going? Is what I thought about as he was preaching. We need to get going. Oh, it's fun to sit around the table, fellowship and have a good time, gaze upon the good things. We need to get going. Maybe you'd make that commitment tonight. Lord, I love to be around you. I want to keep on doing that, but I'm going to have to get to the work. As they play, would you come? May that message settle in on our hearts and leave us with that thought. Are we gazing? You may look this way. Thank you, Brother Green, for being here. What a joy to have you with us. And thank you for preaching what the Lord led you to preach. And I believe that he was in all of the things that went on tonight. And we're grateful for you being our way. I'm going to ask him to slip on out to the lobby and he'll be by the table there. Maybe you'd like to know some information about the direct line ministry, maybe the joy bags. I'd love for everybody to just uh, take some information and be thinking about how you can get involved in that. It'd be a blessing to different folks and we'll certainly enjoy getting to speak with him. Well, we have great news tonight. Uh, Miss Tiffany Rowe right over here. Tiffany, we wave at us. She's right there behind Maddie and, and Amy and uh, she has been coming for some good long time, but uh, we thank the Lord for her. She's saved and back baptized and wants to join Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church. And she's a great blessing to my family and uh, Maddie. And uh, we're thankful for uh, her being here. So we would need a motion to receive her into membership. Brother Jeff Roten up there makes a motion. We would just need somebody to second that. All right, Brother Larry Stover seconds that. All in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Praise the Lord for that. Brother Danny, why don't you come on? We'll call this business meeting to order. He's got one more item that we, we failed to get to the last time we voted on a few things. Get you a microphone.